Welcome to the Birds and the Bees podcast. This is Braxton Dutson. That's the key. People aren't talking about it. Everybody needs to know that porn is not a documentary. It's not like if we don't talk to kids about sex and sexuality, they're not going to hear about it. They're just not going to hear about it from us. They have tons of questions. They just don't know how to ask them. All you have to do is be one chapter ahead. You don't have to know everything. Mm. Just one chapter ahead of wherever your child is. Hey, everyone. This is Braxton Dutson, your host of Birds and the Beast podcast. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and certified sex therapist here in Salt Lake City, Utah. Every episode of this podcast is meant to bring you information from the top professionals in relational and sexual health. I want you to have all the tools, tips, and tricks you need to improve your relationship with your partner and feel confident in teaching your children about sexual health and relationships. Today, we're doing that by bringing Kim Cavill to talk about teens and pregnancy. Now, remember, we love hearing when you I mean, have any episode questions. Um, we're going to be talking about a lot of things when it comes to teens, pregnancy, STIs, there's a lot of things that we're going to be going over today. And there's also a good chance that you you know someone that's gone through this or is actually going through having someone that is pregnant or has a teenager that they're concerned about sexuality with. So be sure to share this episode with them or send them a link and let them know about the show. No one can really get help if they don't know exactly where to go get it. And this is one of the ways that we can we can better spread that information and that education to everybody. Um, I have a lot of people to tell me how much they enjoy the learning from these interviews, and as more and more people learn about the episodes, they uh, we get more and more people talking about it, and through you is the way that other people are going to get this information. So I love it when everyone spreads this information, shares the episodes that they really enjoy, and even lets me know what episodes they enjoy as well. So I appreciate everything that you guys do, and I really love those um, those comments that you give, and I love you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, As of right now, take a minute to leave a review if you're not driving. (laughs) And it means a lot to me for uh, for that as well as you can um, tune into Birds and Bees podcast and listen to these episodes as well as we're on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify. So anyone um, is able to, to tune in and listen. If you have a question... You can call in by calling us at 385-449-1818 and leave a message about what you thought about the show, a show that you'd like to see later on in the, in the year, and I would love to hear your ideas. But as for today, let's get to the show. So we've got Kim here with us. Kim, thanks for being on the show with us. Well, thanks for asking me. It's really nice to be here. Yeah, I've really been really excited for this episode because so many people ask me about how do I keep it? The, the number one topic, it seems like, whenever I start working with parents and teens is how do I keep my kid from one, being sexually active, and two, what happens if my, my child gets pregnant or gets somebody pregnant? And I'm really excited to, to talk about what you do because you're a sexual educator and you're all about helping teens navigate sexuality, especially when it comes to pregnancy. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I, um, I'm a sex ed teacher. I started uh, longer ago than I'd like to admit now. <laughs> <laughs> but I started actually teaching sex ed in Australia when I lived there. And um, I kind of fell into it. A lot of people that teach sex ed uh, you know, end up falling into it. And I fell into it through an interesting route. Um, I started out as a high school English teacher, which I loved. I, I, I love teaching, and I love working with teenagers in particular. And um, I worked my way through college doing disability care assistance work as well, which I equally wow. love. I love working with people with disabilities. And I went um, when I moved to Australia, at that time, they had offered... Um, postgraduate qualifications in disability studies. Now, that wasn't that wasn't offered in the United States anywhere at the time. That's since changed. Thank goodness. Nice. But um, when I was in Australia, I did that qualification, and then I found a job at Family Planning Victoria, which is um, sort of like Planned Parenthood in the United States, but without any of the political baggage. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and so they have a community education team and they were looking for someone to expand their sex education services to everyone in the disability community. So that's what I was hired to do, and that's how I fell into sex ed. 
I fell into it teaching people with disabilities, and so I taught children as young as eight, and I taught people as old as, you know, 85 in assisted care facilities. Wow. And all sorts of ranges of ability. I taught people who were nonverbal, and I taught people who, um, you know, were very high-functioning on, on the spectrum, for example. So, And then on busy times when the rest of my teammates in the community education team were so chock busy with public education, you know, in, in, in schools for typically developing youth, I would get overflow. So um, I kind of ran the gamut for sex wow. ed. That's how I fell into it. I, I fell um, absolutely in love, and um, that's that's kind of how I've worked my way through being where I am today, which is I teach sex ed through a nonprofit agency, which allows me to go to various public schools in the Chicago land area. I go all over the place, and I teach uh, youth seven, grade seven through 12, two different curriculums, one for seventh and eighth graders, uh, one for nine through 12. And it's my job to take those curriculums into schools, teach sex ed, and then hopefully repeat that experience in every school, you know, uh, year after year. So that's what I do. So is there a possibility that you end up catching kids in eighth grade and then ninth and 10th and being able to get them all the way through high school. Yeah. Theoretically, that's how it's supposed to work. Um, Good, consistent sex education is the most effective. Now, you know, it's kind of unfortunately a reality of this particular job in the United States that the consistency can be the hard part. You know, funding can be inconsistent, um, you know, political will to make the funding available can be inconsistent. So it, it's not as consistent as it theoretically should be for maximized efficacy. But uh, we, we absolutely do the best we can. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not in this for the quote-unquote big bucks. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm in it for the fact that I really passionately believe um, in what we do and how important it is. So mm-hmm. we do the, the absolute best we can to catch kids not just once but repeatedly as many opportunities. Yeah. Definitely. And I, I think as you're saying that you, you teach sex ed, we, we may be losing people where that, that seems to be kind of a trigger word for, okay, I'm, I'm shutting off. We're, yeah. we're talking about teaching kids about sex. Can you give us just a quick overlay about what sex education, what that means when you say sex education? Absolutely. There's a lot of myths about uh, what comprehensive sex education really is. A lot of those myths are sensationalized. Good comprehensive sex education does not encourage young people to have sex. It simply acknowledges the reality that some young people, for a a host of different reasons, do. Now, that doesn't mean that that education is tailored only for sexually active young people at the expense of every other young person class who fit into that category, who is sexually active. You know, comprehensive education should have a space for every young person who shows up in that class exactly as they are. So that includes people who are committed to waiting to be sexually active until marriage. And that also includes people who have been sexually active either by choice or, I mean, to be very frank with you, um, you know, not by choice, which is unfortunately the reality of a significant portion of young people today, Mm -hmm. people who have been sexually active not by any choice of their own. You know, their choice has been removed from them. So it's my job to uh, give information, fact-based information, not sensationalized information, and certainly not graphic information, just the facts about no matter who you are, how you identify, what your choices did in the past have been. I'm here as a teacher to help you avoid pregnancy. I'm here to help you avoid getting any sexually transmitted infections. I'm here to help you avoid sexual violence. And I'm absolutely here to answer information and give you the space to think about how that information intersects with your personal values and how to put those things into practice in the way that's best for you and your family. So that's my job. Wow. So taking it in values and being able, you can take a lot from sex education it's not a, a forced on, okay, everyone, let's start having sex. Here's all the condoms. No, absolutely not. No, 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 no. That is, that is, that is not what sex education looks like um, gotcha. on, the, on the ground. Absolutely not. Wow. 
And and to clarify, when you say people that have not had their or had their will taken from them when it comes to being in sex, um, is that are you talking rape? Are you talking sexual abuse? Yes, I am. Okay. I'm talking about forced sex, rape, and mm-hmm. un- unconsensual sex. Yeah. Gotcha. Now I'm I'm you know I I'm a I'm a survivor myself mm-hmm. of childhood sexual abuse. So I and having you know working with youth on a regular basis, uh, statistically speaking. Um, you know, I, I expect, and then, of course, unfortunately, I find out that a significant number of youth have been coerced or forced into sex. I'm really careful with my language around that because yeah. it's not really up to me to write somebody else's story and label it. Um, that wouldn't be empowering to any person who's already been victimized. Yeah. So um, I do talk about sexual violence, but I talk about it in such a way that every student and every young person in my class can get a clear sense of the that, the very minimum. What the law says is right or wrong. To know that the law establishes a minimum, not the maximum for what we can talk about in terms of legality and morality. Mm -hmm. Morality is another layer on top of that. And um, most importantly, to identify uh, long-term support systems around this. You know, I go into schools and then I leave again. And they may or may not see me, so it's important to know who in their school they can talk to that they can talk to their parents and identifying other adults who are in better positions to support those youth long term if that's an experience that they're grappling with. Wow. Wow. That's great work that you're doing. I'm I'm curious about when it comes to uh, I mean as we're talking about teen pregnancies, we're gonna pull back into the kind of teen pregnancy prevention and I'm curious about what the the challenges that uh, that you're seeing that are facing teens right now when it comes to sexual activity? Um, I would say one of, so there's four really that oh. um, I want to talk about. So four, four main challenges. And, and I want to be um, really clear, like, you know, even though I could talk for hours about anecdotal experience, you know, I mean, yeah. we all find ourselves very interesting and I love my <laughs> job. I wouldn't do it if I didn't think it was interesting. Um, you know, the way I do my job is that I don't go in and tell a bunch of personal stories about myself, no matter how interesting I believe myself to be. <laughs> uh, my job is to provide fact-based, evidence-based information. So I'm going to do the same in speaking with you today. So when yeah. I talk about these challenges, these are the challenges that not only I, I have seen on the ground as a person who does this work, but what we also see borne out in the data that we have about this work in general. So that's really four challenges, I would say, about teen pregnancy prevention facing our youth our youth are facing today and number one would be um, the access to education about pregnancy prevention it can be very very patchy and inconsistent mm. so patchy and inconsistent are never what um, a person would ideally want in any kind of educational setting whether you're teaching math science or pregnancy prevention you know um, some because it's an inter- a complicated intersection of federal, state, and local school board laws. Um, sometimes young people get really high quality sex education, and then some young people, just by the nature of where they go to school, just don't. You know, so, um, and those schools can be, you know, geographically 10 miles apart from one another, but just happen to be in different districts. So, it can be really, really patchy, and then year to year it can be inconsistent. So, for example, um, you know, some, some, some young people, for example, in seventh and eighth grade can get, you know, um, kind of the basics of teen pregnancy prevention, which is basically at that level, like how pregnancy actually happens. And then in theory, like don't have sex and you won't get pregnant, which is true. So that's an important message to give, but then Mm -hmm. um, those same students might not get a more detailed follow-up later on in their, in their high school career, which really should be happening when, um, because that's when, that's when young people in general start to get more sexually active. So there should be another follow-up. So the actual access to the necessary education about pregnancy prevention can be very inconsistent. And when the inconsistency is there, that means kids can fall through the gaps. So that's one challenge. The second challenge would be a general broad decreased condom usage, which um, is part of the reason why STI rates have been going up. And in some places, and with some STIs, we're not just talking about going up, we're talking about like skyrocketing levels. Wow. Um, so 
even though there's a lot of good overall trends nationwide here in the United States, like teen pregnancy rates are down, young people are having less sex than any generation before them, they're waiting longer to be sexually active, they're having fewer partners than any generation before them, all that stuff is great. But mm-hmm. the STI rates are going the opposite direction. They're going up. And condom wow. usage is going way down. And that's, by the way, not just for young people. That's for adults, too. <laughs> <laughs> for the aging population yeah, as well. Yeah, so, uh, again, not to try and be graphic, but, like, the withdrawal method or the pull-out method or um, mm-hmm. some older generations say pull out and pray, that method is going way back up again as condom usage goes down, which is why we're seeing STI rates nationwide go up. And then in certain pockets, they're going way, way up. So that's definitely a challenge. Mm -hmm. Um, The third challenge would be uh, access to contraception can also be patchy. You know, the United Mm -hmm. States is a really, really, really big country. And so just logistically speaking, it can be difficult for some people who live in some areas to to actually access reproductive health care and contraception once they need it. It can be a challenge. And then even on top of those that access to contraception, um, some people, when they get that chosen method of contraception, like the pill, for example, don't get the education alongside to be able to use that chosen method effectively to make sure that it works as as good as one can be, as as you can expect it to be. So um, we need more access to and better education about contraception Mm -hmm. for people who do choose to be sexually active. And then I would say the fourth one, which is just starting to be borne out in the data, which, you know, I've known anecdotally for a while, but now I'm really (laughs) glad that we have some data uh, to talk about is the fact that um, online pornography is starting to fill in those gaps that I was talking about with the first challenge of inconsistent education. So those Mm. kids that are falling through the gaps and not really getting the information they need, online pornography is starting to fill those spaces. And, Mm -hmm. and that makes my job and pregnancy prevention harder, you know, in general, Mm -hmm. because that's porn does not exist to teach people how not to get pregnant. So it doesn't do a good job. (laughs) It doesn't do a good job. Not at all. No. So those would be the four main challenges that I see for our young people today. Wow. So there's so many different things that, that, well, at least when we're talking about at least four Mm -hmm. um, things that affect teens and pregnancy. And I think that's fascinating that, when we're looking at condom use going down, it seems as though a lot of pornography is shown without condom use, which totally makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Are these similar across the world? Like when you were in Australia, was that, were those some of the same barriers that you were seeing? Maybe there wasn't that research out there, mm. uh, but was it, was it similar? Now, when I was in Australia, I would say that, you know, on, online pornography didn't, wasn't nearly as accessible um, at that mm. time. Cause this was, I last, I moved back to the United States in 2008. Okay. So I didn't have to deal so much with that issue, although, um, and even though I don't have any data, I would guess if I, if I was a betting person, which I very much am not, but if I was (laughs) betting, I would say that, you know, that's a challenge too. Uh, porn's available everywhere, Australia included, but, um, definitely those other three challenges, uh, existed absolutely and sometimes in lesser degrees but they definitely existed you know australia is also a, geographically speaking a really big country and even though their population is much more concentrated you know 85 percent of their population lives in five cities um mm-hmm. that that still can lead to accessibility issues so one of the things that i did when i was in australia of course because i specialized in working with people with disabilities there weren't a lot of other people doing that job And a big part of my job ended up to be driving out to rural areas and setting up, um, you know, education centers and resource libraries to empower local people on the ground to be able to replicate my job to extend services out to underserved populations in rural areas. We have the same kind of struggle here in the United States. Rural populations are underserved and urban populations are also underserved, even though that seems to be a bit of a paradox. But, you know, in urban cities, you have contraception deserts and education deserts the same as you would have in rural areas. 
simply because, you know, public transport doesn't necessarily get everybody to where they need to go. Public transport can be cost prohibitive for people to use to get to where they need to go, etc. So some similar um, issues that I, you know, I had to deal with in Australia too. And then um, the decreased condom usage is also um, happening in Australia, although to a a less extreme degree. So some, Mm -hmm. some of the things were the same, although, um, uh, you know, it, it wasn't exactly the same. It was, it was a little bit different, but um, yeah, some, some commonality there. Some commonality. Yeah. Would it, and maybe I'm I'm going out on a limb, but is it safe to say that worldwide we're seeing similar things? Do you know any research about worldwide? Yeah, there's been um, a lot of good data coming around, coming out out of particularly about um, young people and pornography usage, actually coming out of the UK. So there's been a recent movement, I'd say, in the last five years to do more, uh, to do more research around that and ask more questions. Now, you know, research um, is what comes out of funding. So that that explains why research can move around a little bit about, um, you know, whose government is making money available to fund the research that we can then use to make decisions. So I would say there's there's obviously been some money in the UK put behind asking questions around young people and pornography in general. Mm -hmm. And um, although you're starting to see some data come out of certain places in the in the United States, too, and and some researchers like out of the Kinsey Institute are asking these questions and starting to publish journals and and even some books that you can buy on Amazon, et cetera. So um, I would say there's some good data coming out of the UK, but um, that's not to say that we don't have data available anywhere else. You know, we do. Wow. 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 So as we're talking about this, you know, the issue of rates of pregnancy are declining in America, Mm -hmm. at least as we're talking, it sounds like worldwide, uh, we're also experiencing that. Do I mean, do parents have something to do with this? What What is the way that uh, that these, how do we help it continue to decline? You know, I, I really wish, because um, I know that a lot of parents are listening, I really wish yes. I could say like, oh, here's a study that shows how great you are. You know, I, I, <laughs> I would love to do that. Uh, we don't have data that shows that kind of, um, you know, causation, showing that attitudes around this generation of parents in particular are influencing those rates, although that doesn't mean that it's not true. We just don't have evidence to, to show us that unequivocally. It doesn't mean it's not true. We just don't have the evidence. So we do have, um, the data does bear out those, the primary drivers of these good trends. And number one, um, the strongest one there is, the data shows, is increased access to reliable forms of contraception. Oh. Reliable forms of contraception. So um, particularly for long-acting forms of contraception. So when I say long-acting, we're really talking about the implant. So that's the mm-hmm. progesterone stick that gets implanted in the upper arm. Mm-hmm. And that and, goes for uh, five years, is that right? Yeah, so it's it's usually about three years, oh, although three. different brands can, you know, stay for different lengths of time. And of course, um, any person can have it removed early should they wish, you know. Um, and then, of course, IUDs, which in previous generations were only made available to people who had previously had children. You know, the, the, the medical consensus in previous generations and decades before was to say that the insertion of the IUD, you know, through the cervix into the uterus was really only tolerable and could be safely performed on people who had had children. Oh. So uh, that's no longer the consensus. Mm-hmm. It's perfectly safe for people to use that before they've had children. And now there's uh, more options available on the market. There are IUDs specifically formed for um, people who haven't had children. You know, they're smaller than the IUDs that have been on the market for a long time. And um, with less hormone in them that stay for shorter lengths of time, like for example, three years. So they're more widely available Mm -hmm. to younger people previously than before. And those are, those are the two highest, you know, most reliable forms of contraception. So as access to more reliable forms of contraception has increased over the last 10 years, um, teen pregnancy rates have started to drop. So we, we do know that contraception access is a big driver of that trend, but it's not 
the only reason. It's not Mm -hmm. the only reason. Another one is a general, I did say it can be inconsistent, but very broadly speaking, nationwide, more sex ed, more Mm -hmm. comprehensive sex and a better quality sex ed. You know, it's not, um, Generally speaking, it's not like six weeks of close-ups of weeping herpes blisters <laughs> <laughs> given by your grudgingly disgusted uh, PE teacher who would rather be anywhere else. Like, <laughs> sex ed doesn't really most of the time look like that anymore, although there are still some teachers who do still like to show a few of those slides that they've had for years and years and years are attached. Mm-hmm. Um, but generally, sex ed is, has gotten better has gotten yeah. better over the decades that helps too and is does uh, that help does that help teens decide that they are that they don't want to have sex does that help them make better choices when it comes to condoms and the pill or getting on an IUD if they don't want to become pregnant so the research shows that comprehensive sex education which does talk a lot about abstinence i mean i say abstinence so much in my comprehensive sex ed classes that um, at one time, the, the teacher was out, and I had to take attendance, and I said, um, okay, instead of who's absent, I'm like, okay, who's abstinent? And I'm like, no, 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 wait, that's not what I meant. You don't need to tell me that. <laughs> I'm trying to say, but it just comes out of my mouth so often, because that's how much I say the word abstinence. And so, <laughs> but I also talk about contraception. Um, so, people who, young people who do choose to be sexually active, Uh, comprehensive sex education shows that they um, use condoms at a much higher rate for less STI risk and they use contraception much more effectively and much more consistently Mm. than, than, than previous. So than previously demonstrated. So this is shown through pre-testing and post-testing and then borne out in risk behavior surveys that are usually done um, every two years at minimum by the federal government. So contraception use goes up and risk behaviors in general go down. And that, that also in shows in, um, you know, fewer partners too after. So, because what's complicated is that, um, you know, when, when we go in to talk about, uh, pregnancy prevention and STI prevention, two generations that generally speaking have seen a decent amount of pornography by the time I get there. You know, the, 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 at, the studies show that the first experience average age of online pornography for um, kids in the United States for boys, it's around 10. Yeah. It's your first, and you know, mm-hmm. that's a lot younger than most parents anticipate. And for girls, it's by 14 where the tipping point is. So I can expect if I'm in a room full of 15 year olds that um, statistically speaking, 75% of them have seen some kind of online pornography and some have been watching it by that point for two years, you know, or more consistently. So um, I, but that, that being said, you know, young people in that position can feel like they know a lot about sex and they can in some ways be correct, but in a lot of other ways, um, those so- same young people have no idea how condoms work. <laughs> they have no idea how pregnancy actually happens. I mean, I still have to answer, uh, I still have to dispel myths about how you know you can't get pregnant by swallowing sperm. Mm-hmm. You know, so they don't know how pregnancy wow. actually happens. And if you don't know how condoms work, what they're for, what STIs are, how pregnancy occurs, you can't expect a young person to make decisions that will protect their health, no matter what their value system or situation is at home. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't, they don't have the available information. So I have to go in and back, you know, kind of backfill, talk like, this is how people can get pregnant. You know, anal sex and oral sex can spread STIs. Yeah. You know? And they're still sex. Yes. You know, and they're still is, sex. That is so important. Exactly. It's like, so important. So many young people think uh, sex is, is, is vaginal sex uh-huh. and that everything else outside of there is just some kind of nebulous um, flirting category. Yes. You know? And if we're not then, talking about it, what, to, what, are the, what else are they supposed to think? If we don't have this exactly. conceptualization, there's yeah. so many. They're like, nope, I'm still a virgin. I'm still fine. And this exactly. is great. And it, and it's not, um, so, you know, it's, it's always interesting, like, you know, as I start to teach my curriculum and when I, what, 
when I make this decision, and I can see when the light bulb goes off, you know, looking out at a classroom of 35 young people, I can see one by one when the connection is made. Like, oh, oral sex is actually sex, and it can, it can transmit STIs, and you can see, because it's a, it's a face of shock and horror, you know, <laughs> when they look and they're like, oh, oh, oh you know, um, because it's mind blowing for a lot of young people yeah. simply because there are big, big gaps in the knowledge. And then, you know, it's my job to go in and, and fill those gaps so that young people can make uh, good decisions in the future. And in some cases, for some young people, that's their first chance to think about um, making some behavioral changes, mm-hmm. you know, uh, to protect their own health. And that's borne out in student feedback, you know, that I get. I get comments at the end of class, um, I'll, you know, I, I got uh, one young person said to me this last spring, you know, I use anonymous post-it notes oh, nice. for, for young people to feel comfortable being honest. And then one person wrote and said, you know, my boyfriend and I have been together for a while. We've been talking about having sex, but we haven't done it yet. And I wasn't, you know, I'm on the pill, so he didn't want to use condoms. But after taking this class, I know he's going to be okay when I tell him that you know, we have to use condoms too, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, even though that might not be an ideal result for all parents who really want their young person to wait until marriage, yeah. you know, um, at the same time, it's my job to make sure every student gets the information they need to do the best they can as, as they show up in my classroom. Definitely. And it's you know? important to, it's important to reiterate that as much and as scary as this conversation is because we want, there's so many parents, uh, especially so many that I talk to. I don't know if there's one that is like, yeah, I really want them to go have sex and just kind of experience all this at age 16 or 17. What We're not trying to, to push this, okay, well, just let your kids go have sex and things like that. The main thing we're trying to do, it's the same as like, oh, we, we hope every teenager get into, gets into a car wreck so they can understand right. what it's like to really drive safe. Or, you know what, let's, let's give yeah. every teenager some, some heroin or some you know, weed yeah. to smoke so that they know that's not what we're pushing this for. The, the thing that we're talking about is we talk about driver's ed. We talk about drug safety from young ages. And they're watching everyone driving, and they kind of know what is unsafe driving, and we know what is unsafe when it comes to to drugs. And then we've got all these gaps when it comes to sex, and they are it is it blows my mind to hear some of the things that teenagers and kids talk about when it comes to I mean, so much as where the baby comes from and how. Yeah the baby comes out of the body and how the baby gets in the body and what is safe, what is not safe, what becomes the loopholes. And I think that these loopholes are the piece that we really need to nip in the bud because yes. that's where the oral sex, the anal sex, um, hand jobs and everything else. And then coercion. I mean, we're yeah, also talking about what's important in that, that they get coerced into a sexual experience because no one's talking to them about what is appropriate for sex no one's talking to them about what the risks are besides being pregnant and then if they feel like all right well i'm on the pill and i'm fine then that gives them the okay and if we talk about it they know it doesn't give them the okay and they still get to work with their values but parents we have to relinquish this control over we can control our teens in any given situation we can give them all the tools that we want however if they don't have all of the tools, we expect them to make their own decisions on a very limited basis, and we have to change that. It's and I, you know, I'm a parent myself, and it, it it's it is the coolest and the hardest thing I've ever done. You know, and I'm on, I've I've done underwater cave diving, so like I've done some cool hard stuff, and being a mom by far is the coolest <laughs> and the hardest thing I've ever done. So, you know, and even though this is my job, I still have those same sorts of instinctual reactions i mean i you know i'm when my oldest was five even though i've been laying groundwork for sex i mean i've been doing sex ed since they were potty training because you know building blocks of sex ed or you know like this is your body this Mm -hmm. these are what its parts are called you're the boss of it not anybody else this is where this is public and private and then you know we just talk in different layers of complexity as my children age but even at five um I remember when my son looked at me and he was like, well, how does the sperm get to the egg? 
because obviously we'd had previous conversations. He knew that sperm can get to the egg and then baby, et cetera. And he was asking, how does the sperm get to the egg? Mm -hmm. And so in that moment, even though I'm a professional, <laughs> I'm standing there, I'm looking at my five-year-old son. And I was like, wait a second. And then I double checked. I'm like, is this what you're asking me? And he's like, yeah, I want to know how the sperm gets to the egg in the first place. And there was that kind of split screen in my head that parents can go into <laughs> of like expectations and reality and how they're not always matching up. And I was like, I can't believe I'm here already. Like, I just, and I just like, just, I can't believe that I'm here already at five. And so we had this conversation, you know, and it's fine. And, um, and, and it was great and everything else, but I understand that reaction and I empathize with it. But um, one of the things that I, points that I like to make to parents is that that reaction in and of itself is a good thing. And it is a wonderful teaching opportunity because if you're nervous and if you're, if you're scared and if you're really uncomfortable, you get to model for your child, how you grapple with those feelings and you work through them and you're resilient enough to make it out the other side and be closer together in your relationship rather than further apart. Mm -hmm. And that is such an important skill, especially if you have the hope and the expectation for your child that they will eventually be in a healthy relationship that also includes some kind of sexual activity, like, like marriage, for example. So if you're expecting your, your young person to succeed in that area, you know, as an adult, then this is an opportunity to demonstrate for them an emotional resilience in working through discomfort, which is a necessary part of talking about sex, even when you're married as an adult. Oh, definitely. 100%. <laughs> and, man, it is, it, it is such a difficult, and that's why that's a huge reason I do this podcast is because parents, we, that uncomfortability, if there's anything that I hope adds to your, your confidence is to be able to talk about this, is to have this information and know, you know what, we're going to run into uncomfortability. Mm -hmm. This is, it, it's uncomfortable. And especially because many of these parents have not had this education prior to, and many of us haven't had the the example set to have these conversations. And so we're setting those examples. You're setting the new example for talking about values and sexuality, and you get to, to have these conversations, and it can be very difficult on yeah. any given turn, and very unexpected, too. <laughs> and so that's what I would say for parents who have this kind of problem that, that, you know, I have a feeling of like, well, I can't let this go. I can't, I don't want my child to be sexually active and I can't accept that that's a possibility. I understand that. Absolutely. But I would say rather than disagreeing with that, you know, I, it's not my place to disagree. I mean, who am I? I? You know, I'm not raising your children. I would say to be more successful with that, to just turn it around and look from the other side to say, okay, like I really don't want my child to be sexually active. And so it'd be like, you can accept that and say, I really don't. It's really important to my value system that my child not be sexually active. Then instead of looking at it from the point of view, or like, how do I build the fence? So how am I going to build the fence for my child so that they stay in the fence uh -huh. so that everything, you know, uh, the fence isn't going to work. Teenagers are programmed to jump over any fence that they see. That's <laughs> their job. That is their job. And if they're not jumping over their fence, they're, you just don't know, you don't see the fence that they've jumped over. Like that's their job. That's part of how they're supposed to learn. So instead of concentrating on building a bigger, taller, smaller fence, instead, I would suggest you talk to them about why you feel like you need that fence to be there, why that fence is so important to you, why you built that perhaps around yourself, or perhaps why as a young person you didn't have that fence and you regret it and wish you did, and why you're trying to do it for your child now. So instead of trying to say like, okay, I'm going to continue, you know, no, you can't go this way and you can't do this. And you, you know, teenagers, as soon as you put that line in the sand and you have a fence, they're going to jump right over it because that's their job. So instead, what you're trying to do is give them the information to build their own fence. That's the point. Mm -hmm. Because they, they need that as a life skill as an adult. That's boundary making. So you, instead of making boundaries on behalf of your child and then getting upset when they're not compliant, as is their job, 
you're going to teach them how to make their own fence and how to police it themselves. And so just, I would say, you know, for parents who are experiencing that, turn the frame around a little bit, give yourself a new job and you'll be much more pleased with the results. The job to help them build their own fence, make yeah. their own values, set their own boundaries. Exactly. With then also your influence. It themselves. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. They don't know how to do that. It's your job to teach them. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the whole point. It's not your job to build a fence and then make the fence bigger and bigger as they get older. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until they're married and you can hand the fence off to somebody else. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the job is to teach them how to how to build their own boundaries, how to look after themselves, make their best decisions, and then and, and they can't do that on their own. That's That's your job as a parent. So I would say just have a different kind of conversation. It doesn't mean you have to let go of your goal. Absolutely not. You're just going about it in a different way. Yeah, most definitely. Because as we've seen, it, it's not as, as effective to not talk about it, to then just say don't have sex and hope for the best. Because that's really what it turns out to be is hoping and hoping yeah. that yeah. it becomes that way. And you sent me some really interesting percentages of sexual expressions within teens from uh, like ages 15 to 19. So this, this high school age. Um, It really seems like race, socioeconomic status has a big impact on teens participating in sexual activity. And I'm curious about what some of the issues are that uh, that make such changes between race, socioeconomic status. Like, how come there's such a big change in between there? Do you have an idea? Yeah, a lot of this comes down to access. And I know that we hear that word all the time now, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so I don't mean to turn people off. Um, but it's really, it, it, it really is the issue. So when I say access, I mean access to education, the kind of education that we're talking about. I don't get to every school in the Chicagoland area. Yeah. And there aren't a whole lot of people like me that are around doing this kind of job. So access to education is an issue, access to contraception, and then the education necessary to make that contraception effective, access to health care in general. You know, so when we're talking about regular STI testing for people who do choose to be sexually active, that can be a barrier mm-hmm. for people who do not have access to health care or someone who lives, you know, in a really rural area and can't get to the doctor every six months for testing and access to supportive adults. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, that that can mean parents, that can mean foster parents, that can mean um, aunts, uncles, adult friends, a supportive social worker at the school, supportive adult systems around over a long term, over a long haul. So it's the access to those necessary things that correlate with increased risk for things like teen pregnancy um, and sexual violence. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then STIs. And then that risk goes exponentially upward as soon as you, um, as soon as you include uh, young people who identify as members of the LGBTQ community. Oh, wow. You know, so, so when when you have someone who's, for example, um, you know, identifies as lesbian or gay and they're black and they're in a, you know, an impoverished socioeconomic area with low access to contraception, health care, et cetera, then their risk, of course, statistically goes up with each of those risk factors. Oh. So, yeah, so there can, it's just access barriers to access can, um, have a dramatic effect on those kind of risk categories that we see in people who have disproportionately uh, higher risks for sexual behaviors, et cetera. Tend to have less less access to the education or to any yeah, to exactly. health care and things like that. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, um, people need the basic tools in order to, um, you know, people need basics in order to make what... Um, what we're really talking about is quote unquote good decisions. Now I know good is a subjective word, but we're talking, when we're talking about in public health policy, you know, that means lower rates of STI infections, lower rates of teen pregnancy, et cetera. I mean, agreed upon consensus goals. And it makes those goals harder to achieve when the access to the tools that make those goals achievable Mm -hmm. are low. So, you know, for people who have low access for whatever reason, rural area, um, impoverished area, you know, um, in any of those risk categories, it's just, it just becomes harder and harder and harder to access the things that they need, um, to dramatically lower their risk of those sorts of broad based public health policy goals. Gotcha. I thought it was interesting in, in table 133, it's girls across the ethnicities and, and socioeconomic statuses. It sounds like everyone 
on average is participating in sexual activity about 38 percent and so i mean a, a third of a third of females are uh are participating in sex from 15 to 19 yeah. and boys seem to have the most change when it comes to um 38 percent of white males 52 percent of black males and then 44 percent of of uh hispanic males mm-hmm. are participating in sexual activity so these rates are still they're still really high yeah. when it comes yeah. to that mm-hmm. and yeah. i'm curious about i mean as we're but as we're also seeing in table 149 that we've got girls are using contraceptives and um, they're like 43%, males are at 30%. I guess we've been talking about it too. I'm trying to formulate my question around, we've got all these these individuals that are participating in sexual activity. And that's, I imagine that scares a lot of parents where we're looking yeah. at 40, roughly 40%, if not more, of these kids are sexually active. Yes, yeah. It, yeah, so I mean by the time by the time you get to 12th grade, generally speaking, anywhere between um, 60 to 80 percent of young people in, in 12th grade um, are sexually active. Now, again, knowing that when we talk about sex, a lot of people have an instinctually narrow definition of, 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 of that. Now, mm-hmm. I don't, you know because of my job. I have a yeah. very expansive view of what constitutes sexual activity. So that we're not just talking necessarily about penis and a vagina to be super frank. You know, there's lots of other ways that people, mm-hmm. young people included, have sex. So um, when we look at that data, depending on how you're slicing it up, you're going to see different things. So I would just, you know, for parents that um, are maybe listening into this car in the car and just had to pull over to breathe into a paper bag, like, <laughs> Okay, we're just going to breathe, breathe through the paper bag, and then remember that um, you know, spe- sex is generally more expansive when we look at this data mm-hmm. than what a lot of parents' first instincts would indicate. So, when we're looking at those statistics, that doesn't mean that every single person who answered yes is having penis and vagina sex. Now, that doesn't mean that that that, that doesn't mean that oh, then everything's fine. That's not what I'm saying. Absolutely yeah. not. I mean. I have a job <laughs> in part because of this data, you know, um, because we're still trying to get these numbers as low as we can, just from a public policy point of view and reducing young people's risk. Mm-hmm. Just the issue is, again, access. So, you know, for, for, for my job, as I said, there's, there's, it's kind of always been built into the, the spectrum here in the United States where I have a job depending more or less on who's in charge of the federal government. And I'm not having a go. That's just built into the job. I would do the job anyway. That's fine. Every job has its downfall, and that happens to be mine. So, you know, I'm also not in meetings, you know, from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. at night. So, you know, every job has its downfall. Mine can kind of be a political football. Mm -hmm. And what I'm not upset about that for my own personal well-being. I'm upset about that on behalf of the young people who end up falling through those gaps. Yeah. You know, who, who don't get access to the information they need in order to lessen their own risk for health behaviors, their own sexual risk, and take charge of their own health and perhaps make better decisions about themselves and their behavior to, in order to reduce their risk. So, you know, it, it, it all comes together to intersect under that big umbrella of, of access. And, you know, uh, a lot of times here in the United States, me working in largely public schools in, you know, suburban Chicago, a lot of us operate under what frankly is kind of a delusion that our schools have been completely desegregated. Mm. From a legal point of view, that's true. From a practical point of view, that's not true. Mm. So certain schools, because of the way our education system is funded and who goes to what school and who, you know, the, the district lines that, that funnel kids into various schools, some schools get are, do have the funding, for example, and the grant money comes to have somebody like me come in and do this job. Other schools can't afford to buy uh, textbooks or or turn on the heat in the mm-hmm. winter. And so I'm obviously not able to go into the schools because as much as I'd like to do this for free, I'm not in a financial position to be able to do that. So you just end up, that means there are a lot of kids that, that don't have access to ac- education like the sort that I provide. Mm-hmm. And um, 
you know, if they don't have access to that education or if, or if they do hear about STI testing, for example, but can't actually get to a clinic in order to be tested, you know, uh, then we have to lower our expectations for what those young people are able to achieve themselves with a very limited set of tools. Yeah. You know, so I would just urge parents to keep that in mind when they look at that data and then um, turn that initial kind of panic into, well, what can I do? You know, and if you're a parent yourself, there's a lot you can do. And even if you're not a parent yourself or if you're a concerned aunt or a friend, for example, who's interested in advocating on behalf to, of, of young people in this way, there, there's, there's plenty. There's plenty to do. And the nice thing about the Internet, you know, aside from the you know, we've got the proliferation of online pornography, which I can uh-huh. rant about all day. But um, <laughs> the flip side of that coin is that we also have a lot of good access to excellent resources online. Whereas as long as you can find a Wi-Fi connection, for example, at your local library, or even a local McDonald's, you can sit and um, get access to good, high quality, comprehensive sex education, even if your school doesn't have the funds to provide it. You know, yeah. And you can teach your kids about it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And then that's it. such an important part of this that I that I'm passionate about is that you can ha- you can be the one that is teaching your kids about this, and this is really important. It's important to get everyone to know about it, and the access that you're talking about is so back and forth, depending on where where you're at, where you're listening. Yeah. Uh, one of the last things that uh, um, I was curious about was you sent me an article about HPV, the human papilloma yes. virus. I think I yes. said that right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting. I had no idea it was linked to so many different cancers. Yeah. Um, the, now, again, I could go on about this all day because it's so important. <laughs> um, but I, I'll, I'll cover, I think, what's most important. So HPV, I mean, HPV was a common STI when I was young. It was common when my parents were young. You, you know, HPV, the human papillomavirus, very, 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 very common. Um, it's so common that, um, like, if I walked into, to put statistics into a practical example, if I walked into a, a standard university classroom, like, let's say everybody's having lunch in a dorm. It's all a bunch of college freshmen. And if I pulled five random people out of that group and I tested them for HPV, statistically speaking, uh, three would come back positive. Wow. And that's, that's irrespective of, of prior sexual activity, not taking into account any other kinds of factors like number of partners, ST, you know, uh, barrier contraception usage. So I'm talking about um, internal, external condoms and then dental dams, again, for oral sex, et cetera. Um, that's how common it is. It's extremely common. Mm-hmm. However, however, uh, the most important thing that we can do as parents is to get our kids vaccinated. Now, without wading into that entire conversation about vaccines, uh-huh. um, you know, I, I will say that this vaccine in particular is incredibly safe and it's incredibly effective. So it's 90% effective. And each generation of the vaccine that they make covers more high risk strains of HPV, which are the strains that are related to cancers and it grows in, a, in its efficacy. So, um, a lot of, when the HPV vaccine first became available, you know, the marketing buzz was like, oh, it can prevent genital warts. And um, I wish I'd been in that marketing focus group because I would have said, like, you're not going to get people to buy in with this kind of a tagline. Like, that's great that you can avoid genital warts. But let's focus on the fact that you've developed an effective vaccine against cancer. It's mm-hmm. a cancer vaccine is what it is, which is incredible, and it's very effective. So the kinds of cancer that HPV in particular are linked to are cervical cancer, which is the one that's most commonly known, mm-hmm. cervical cancer. And, um, but what most people don't realize is that it's also linked to oral cancer, anal cancer, and throat cancer. So head, neck cancer, and anal cancer mm-hmm. for men in particular. Wow. So it's not just a vaccine that's important for girls. It's a vaccine that's important for everyone, young boys included, simply because of its commonality, even if in your best case scenario as a parent, even in your best case scenario where your child delays sexual activity until they're married in, let's say, I don't know, their early or mid-20s, they still, just by having one partner, 
increase their risk, you know, their spouse of being eventually exposed because it's that common. And then when we think about how often it is that even a person who wants to wait till marriage dabbles in with oral sex, dabbles in with other types of sex, because remember expanding that view of sex Mm -hmm. from a public policy point of view, they're still at a decent risk because HPV in and of itself is so common. So it's so important as parents to get vaccinated. Here in the United States, the FDA has said that Young people between the ages of 9 and 26 can get the vaccine. Now, pe- most pediatricians like to give the first dose around 11 or 12. Oh, not, okay. Not as young so this, as isn't a, this isn't a baby, a baby no, vaccine. This is no, 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 a child. No. This is a child. So they like to give the first dose ideally around 11 or 12. Then you get a second dose about six months later, and then you're done. Now, that follow-up is really important. A lot of parents we've seen in the data get that first shot and then they never bring back for the follow-up and then you're gambling. And again, I'm not a gambling person and I wouldn't gamble with my child's health, especially when it comes to cancer. So you got to come back for the follow-up. Now, if, if the first dose isn't given in given after the age of 15. So if you're a young person, 16, for example, and you're hearing me talk and you're like, I got to call the pediatrician. (laughs) I mean, good for you. That's excellent. Yes, you do. But after the age of 15, it's going to be three shots. Okay. Instead of two, it's going to be three, but it is available up until the age of 26. And it's super, super important to get 90% effective. And you're, you're dramatically reducing your child's risk for cervical cancer, anal cancer, oral cancer, and throat cancer because what's um, and lastly why why this is so important especially for young boys I'm a parent of young boys um, is that for whatever reason and science hasn't figured this out yet uh, boys that are exposed to HPV that demonstrate no symptoms most of the time this 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 STI is completely asymptomatic so they carry it they have it they don't know they experience no symptoms um, but it for whatever reason is lingering in the throat and can sit there like a, you know, like a sleeping dragon for decades. And then all of a sudden in adult life can come out and explode and it's a very high risk strain. So it's almost like it erupts, but it's decades in a delay. So um, that's why that vaccine is so important, especially being in the United States that you can really only get it up into the age of 26. So in terms of STI prevention, what's important for parents to know, you know, educate yourself alongside your child, model for your child how to learn about this information that you don't know and then um you know you're going to emphasize if if the young person has decided to be sexually active condoms and barrier methods of protection are so important Mm -hmm. or um reducing their risk in general so maybe reducing their risk of you know their their number of partners etc and then lastly get that vaccine the hpv vaccine is really effective and so important for our young people here in the states yeah, it sounds like it. Do you do you end up working with uh, with teenagers that um, that have become pregnant, or is this all prevention yes. that you work on? Okay. Yes. No, I mean generally speaking, in your um, common public school classroom, I can walk in and and let's say I'm doing all of the tenth graders, so that's five to six classes of thirty five people. On average, there'll be um, anywhere from three to eight. Uh, pregnant or mothering parents that are already in that classroom. Mm. Yeah. So I work with people who are pregnant, people who are already parents, et cetera. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In getting into talking about that a little bit, um, I know we're, we're getting close on time. I guess that for, for lack of a better question, does it doom the child to a life of, I don't know, of being in this, this horrible place? I hear it makes life harder. And so, so when I talk, the first thing that I do when I meet young people, I don't actually talk about sex at all in that first session. Mm-hmm. I, don't bring, I, I don't talk about that at all yet. What we start with is um, an ex- exercises that um, highlight, give, give young people the space to think about um, what are things I've already achieved in my life? What are things I want to achieve in the next five years? What are things that I really want to do in the next 10 years? When I envision my life at five-year goals and 10-year goals, what do I want my life to look like? And then we, so after we do that kind of exercise and, and discuss those sorts of goals that young people bring up, then we can, and we think of, okay, so pick the goal that's most important to you and what are at least two things you need to do in order to make that goal a reality. And then we kind of start working on a plan for the most passionate goal for these young people. 
Then we say, what are things that might be barriers to achieving those goals? Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, for young people who say, like, well, I want to go into the military. Certain branches of the military won't accept you if you have STIs, you mm -hmm. know, and, and you take your, your health panel test and they say, no, you can't. You can't enter our particular branch of service. So that would make that goal much harder to achieve, you mm -hmm. know, for example. Um, and then, of course, having a child before you're ready can also make graduating from college a lot harder. It can make graduating from high school a lot harder. So when I have that discussion with young people, it's not effective and it's not actually true for me to sit there and say, if you do this, if you get pregnant or if you get an STI, your life is over. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not true. Um, it's not empowering. Yeah. And it's not my place. You know, um, the more effective and the truer thing to say is that it makes your your goals harder you have to work harder mm -hmm. to achieve those goals and so it doesn't mean that they're impossible because remember how would a young mother who's already in my class or someone who's pregnant already in my class feel if i said if you're pregnant you might as well give up absolutely wow not. No. yeah that no. just, it stops it yeah yeah no so we say it gets harder you have to have more support, you know, in order to achieve those goals. It might take you longer to achieve those goals. It might take longer to graduate from college. You know, it might be harder to get a scholarship, et cetera. It might take longer to save up for a house or a car. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's really the message. And wow. the other part of that message is just because, you know, you're a parent now, for example, it's still up to you what you want to do with your future. So, yeah. You know, to make, say, like, you can still learn about contraception. We're still going to learn about contraception because you have a whole future ahead of you. So if you're just slamming the door in a young person's face with no real knowledge of how they got there or why they're there, in my view, you're not just slamming the door in a young person's face, which as a teacher is antithetical to what I'm supposed to be doing. You're slamming a door in their child's face, too. And as a parent, that's an unforgivable thing to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. So, you know, there, there are other ways to talk about it that are no less honest, that are more empowering for young people who still have an entire future ahead of them, along with their child. Oh, yeah. And I, I think if we constantly hear stories of someone being pregnant at a young age and reaching really high heights, and they do. They have to work hard, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of emotional struggle that's involved. There's, there's a lot that comes with pregnancy. However, I think what I'm gaining from what you're saying here is if you are teaching your child to not have sex, and they do have sex, that is not the, the end-all, be-all. If they do get pregnant, it does not mean your child's future is completely ruined. It does not mean that Anything. I mean, th th it involves higher conversation. It involves more more look at what the future holds, and yeah, that uh, that seems to me like let's not give up on someone or some situation when it seems like great we've failed what our first goal was, mm. and let's not look at that. No. Well, no. Kim, I really appreciate you being here on the show. Um, I, if anyone wants to get a hold of you, uh, how can they find you? Uh, you can find me, uh, I have a website, teaandintimacy.com. You can find me there. And it's completely ad-free. I pay for the hosting myself. I, I don't put any ads on it at all because, um, first of all, ads are annoying. Second yes. of all, ads always come with data collection, which is part of the whole internet ethics and privacy conversation I have with young people mm -hmm. who... Um, you know, maybe watch porn and don't realize that somebody is always, always watching. The internet is written in ink, not pencil. Mm -hmm. So you can find me on my website. It's completely ad-free. You can find me on my email address at sexpositiveparent at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter. And I'm very, very proud to say you can't find me on Facebook. So... <laughs> 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 um, you can find me through all those all those methods and um, you can reach I get a lot of email questions I'm always happy to help and you can reach out and I'm usually pretty good about getting back to people within 24 hours wonderful well thank you so much Kim it really was a treat to have you on and I appreciate you tackling this this conversation that is so difficult to have at times Oh, it's my pleasure. If I can just say to the parents who are listening one more thing. Yeah. Um, if you're nervous, if you're scared, 
if you feel lost, if you feel really uncomfortable, working through those feelings in front of your child models the emotional resilience they need to successfully negotiate a healthy sex life for themselves within the context of any future relationship. And our culture values competence at the expense of vulnerability. So talking with your children about sex, these conversations are really opportunities to dismantle that myth of personhood. So admit that you're scared. Admit you're scared. Admit that you feel vulnerable. Admit that you're nervous and especially admit when you don't know or you need to take a break and talk about it at another time where you're feeling more comfortable. Then show your child how to circle back and learn new information together and show that you can work through those kinds of issues and increase your intimacy rather than just pull people further apart. And you will be doing your child and yourself a tremendous, tremendous service. Get used to being uncomfortable and own it. Mm -hmm. Wow, I love that, Kim. (laughs) (laughs) No, it was great talking to you. And thanks for the opportunity to come on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem at all. We'll have to have you on again as things come up. Sure, sounds good. Okay, we'll talk to you all in the next episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Wasn't that a great interview? Man, I love interviews like this. Remember, we love when you send these episodes to your friends and family. There's a good chance you know someone who could use some extra support or the information that was just discussed in this last episode. Send them a link. Tell them about it. You can send it through iTunes. Send them the birdsandbeastpodcast.com link. Any way that, that best will get them the information. And it can help a lot to those that you love. We really appreciate you sharing this. Please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. That helps us immensely with getting the, this content out. And know that, uh, that I love you. Love the fact that you guys are helping me out with my goal and sharing this information with the entire world and changing the way that we talk about sexual health and changing the interactions we have with our kids as well as our partners. If you have any questions or you want to join the conversation, send me a call or give me a text at 385-449-1818. Send me an email, birdsandbeastpodcast at gmail.com. All this is going to be great. Love to hear from you hive mates. And I look forward to uh, to talking with you guys in the next episode. So until then, keep the uh, sexual health buzz alive, and I'll see you in the next episode. <laughs>